If you have your scripture, turn to John the 17th chapter. One of the greatest passages of scripture anywhere in the Word of God. Again, let me say it's a pleasure to see you here. As I often have reminded you, if you hadn't come, there wouldn't be anybody here. Got to think about that a minute, but uh, that's the reality. And don't forget the shoe boxes up here. There's one your size somewhere. And just come and pick it up. And uh, if it happens to be too large for your little foot, just fill it with other good things. And bring yeah. those back by no, the first week of November, I think, is when they have to be in. See that if you have any questions about yeah. that, yeah. these okay. can help you with that and uh, others. But this effort by Samaritan's Purse is a great thing. And I know you want to participate. So make that available as soon as you can. Let's look at the first verse of uh, John 17, where Christ is speaking. After he had said this, and what he had said is, take heart, I'll overcome the world. And then he begins by saying, after the scripture says, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, until that he might give eternal life. To all those you have given him. Let me read that a little more smoothly. That he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Now let's bow our heads once more in prayer. Father, once again, I pray that the Word of God would speak to us as we deal in these few moments with this all-important truth in this passage. I pray again the Holy Spirit will do His work both in the pulpit and in the pew. And Father, I pray that when we leave here today, we'll know not just that we had singing and preaching, but above all, that You have met with us to touch us at our point of need. And I thank You for what You'll do in Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. You may be seated. I'm going to talk to you this morning about what I call what a prayer. What a prayer. In the Word of God, we discover that Jesus is praying. Now, this is a very strange thing in a way. This is perhaps one of the greatest passages in the Word of God. In fact, some people have called this the Holy of Holies of the book of John. Others refer to Jesus' prayer as the great intercessory prayer of Jesus Others call it a high priestly prayer, and others say this is the true Lord's prayer. But however you look at it, or whatever you designate it to be, Jesus is praying. How often would it be that we heard him pray? This is one of the rarest things in the Word of God. We know that there have been many great people in the Word of God who are mighty prayers, or prayers. But we don't have too many prayers recorded of all of them either, but they bless us when we read them. But when I turn into the Word of God and discover that Jesus is letting us in on a prayer that He prayed, it speaks to me very strongly. We ought to read this chapter very often because it's a powerful thought. Hearing somebody else pray is not something we do very often. Many of us have heard parents pray for us. It always seems to be a holy moment if we hear others call our name in prayer. Some years ago, earlier back to the last century, a Presbyterian minister in Darlington, Pennsylvania, was out on his pastoral rounds, and in those days he rode horses to do his visitation. And he rode down a country lane and drew up before an humble cottage where he heard somebody praying inside. He recognized the voice of a widowed mother, and as he peered through the door, he saw that she had her two boys, one on either side, arms around them, praying for God to open doors for them to be educated and to be trained and to become the kind of young men they should. The pastor dismounted the horse, went inside, and as he spoke with the woman, he was moved not only by her tears and her prayers, but by one of the young boys who seemed to be pretty outstanding as a child. And so he began to question her about the boy, and as a result, he said, well, God can answer prayer for one of the boys, I'll take him to Stone Academy in Darlington, and there I'll give him the education that's needed. And so he did. Hearing the mother's prayer, he took this boy and educated him. That boy, who was born in such a handicapped situation, and for whom there seemed to be no 
important future. That boy influenced more children and minds in America in the last century than any other man. His name was William McGuffey, the author of the famous Eclectic Readers, which had an extraordinary circulation of over a hundred million copies. Many of you are familiar with the readers. Most of us are not old enough, maybe any of us are old enough to have ever used them in school, but they set the pace for modern education in the reading of books, something that's never been quite equal, equal again. He overheard a mother's prayer, and he responded as God led him to do. A dad went into his son's room to put him to bed <clears> one night, and he heard his little boy pray a very humble prayer. And as he prayed, he said, Father, make me like my daddy. That broke the dad's heart. He went out in the hallway, got on his knees. With tears running down his cheeks, he prayed, <laughs> Lord, make me like my little boy. You see, the humility and the simplicity of hearts is entered in in the matter of prayer. And when we hear somebody else pray, it often speaks to us. I've heard people pray. I've heard people pray for me. And it always stirs me when somebody does that. Jesus was a man of prayer. We don't have many prayers that he prayed recorded, however. There are a few references in Scripture. But here is, is one of the most powerful statements by the Son of God himself in prayer. He was a man of prayer. As the Son of God, he prayed often. In fact, he prayed all night before the Sermon on the Mount. There were other times that he prayed all night. But look at this prayer where the Bible says that first he prayed for himself. Himself. John 17, 1 that I read said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. In other words, his work was finished. He knew that he had completed the task that he came to earth to do. And what was that task? your salvation and mine. He had come to complete all that was necessary so that we might be saved. Jesus knew that his hour had come. Sometimes throughout the scripture, it talks about his hour, but often it would say, John often said, but his hour has not come yet. The time wasn't right, but in God's timing, the time had come and he had finished the work, the work of salvation. And notice that when he speaks of this, he says, I glorified you on the earth. Jesus always looked at the cross as glorifying God. The Apostle Paul did a similar thing. Paul said, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom I am crucified into the world, in the world unto me. Glory in the cross. Now, I, I'm captivated by these words that Jesus said, make me like I used to be. Do for me what you did before I left heaven. Let me become again what I was before I came to this earth. Now there's no way in the world you and I can understand the scope of those words. How in the world can a perfect son of God come to this earth to be born to a virgin and to grow up as he grew up in poverty, never wealthy, always on the go, and go through a life like he did and then come to die on the cross how in the world could he give all of heaven up where he was the praise and the worship of angels? Where he's the center of the attraction? Where everything God did and had pointed to him? Where he developed the word of God that would be in our hands that always ran him through every praise, uh, every word and every page like a red thread from cover to cover? Jesus had given all that up to come and be despised and hated and persecuted and to eventually die on the cross, as you know. And here he says, Father, that's going to be gone. Let me be like it used to be. So if you know something about what it is to be away from home, most of us want to get back home. I was, we were in Mexico years ago, and I saw the poverty. People eating out of trash cans, people sleeping under bridges, and things like sometimes we see in our day in other places. And I wanted to come back home where it was safe and secure and calm, where there's a warm family to receive me. I remember my years in evangelism, how often I would be across the country, my little family would be somewhere stationed in Utah or in, in, in some other section of the country. And I hated to leave them. 
I wanted to go back home. I remember those days when sometimes I was gone so much in preaching revivals that when I would come home and get in my car to go to the grocery store, my little children would run to the front door and, and cry and scream because they thought I was leaving again. I remember those lonely days. I remember how wonderful it was to come home. I wanted to always be back home. And I think about what Christ must have given up. And I remember the words of the songwriter that said that none of the ransomed ever knew how dark were the waters crossed, nor how deep was the night that the Lord passed through ere he found his sheep that was lost. What a difficult thing for the Son of God to do. Some years ago, Dr. Hyman Appleman, a name that many of you know, was called the modern-day Apostle Paul, was one of the greatest evangelists that we ever had in America. He was Jewish, and he was called the Apostle Paul, the modern-day Apostle Paul, because of the power of his messages. He was the first man in America to develop area-wide crusades. Multitudes of people would come to hear this great preacher preach. Well, in his latter years, I was evangelism director for North, North, uh, Northern Plains Baptist Convention, and then uh, actually Washington and Oregon, and all of that territory up there, Northwest Convention. And I brought him out there to, to speak at evangelism conference. Well, he preached, but we had conferences also in Canada. And then I would take all the team that was with me to Canada. But Hyman Appleman stood out. I remember riding with him on the plane. He would get a stack of magazines, and he would say, read this, read this, read this. And I never read anything. He read them so fast and handed to me, I didn't have time. He was always absorbing. He was a great man of God, but his fervor was in evangelism, and his wife would send me his pills. He had a bad heart. And she would send me his medication to be sure that he got it, because she said, if I send it to him, he'd probably never pick it up. A mighty man of God. But what stuck out to me was his desire to go home. And I accompanied him across Canada as he preached. He came back into Portland where we were, our office. And I heard him preach there. And he would say to me, Clyde, I'm going home in three weeks. Then he would say, I'm going home in two weeks. And I knew that going home was extremely important to him. And I remember the day that he got on the plane and he said to me, Clyde, I'm going home back to Kansas City. I watched him leave Portland, Oregon on that plane that day. He flew into Kansas City, got off the plane, went straight to the hospital, and there he died, having never gone back to his earthly home, but to his heavenly home. And I thought about the desire of that great evangelist to be at home. And it burns true in all of our hearts. Whatever home may be, there's no place quite like it. And when the Son of God had to give up what He did, what a wonderful, wonderful thought that He longed to go back home. Notice in verse 2 that gives, the Father has given the Son authority over all mankind, and the Son gives eternal life to those the Father has given to the Son. And then this is what I like in chapter 17. He says that each believer is God's love gift to the Son. Again, it's mentioned in the uh, practice, mentioned seven times in that chapter. John 6, 37 mentions this, that you as a Christian were given to God or given to Jesus by a gift from God. Now, you may not be much to anybody else, but I'll tell you what, you are a gift to Christ. And I remind you that any gift to Christ is never going to be rescinded. Never is it going to be taken back Romans 11.29 says that the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. That is, He never changes His mind. When He gives it, it's secure. And our salvation is secure. Because the Father is never going to take His gift back from His Son. You are His gift to Him. But He goes on further, and the Bible says that He prayed for His disciples. Not just for Himself, but for His disciples. Notice in verses 8 and 9. He said, for I gave them the words that you gave me, and they accepted them. They, they knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me. Now we know that God loves the world. John 3.16 teaches us that. But here he was praying specifically for his disciples, which in a sense even includes us. 
actually what he was saying. If you look at, at chapter 17, verse 17, he's praying not only is in verse 11 that they'll be protected, but he prayed that they will be sanctified. That means that they will be set apart to be used in a mighty way. That word sanctification has a lot of meaning to it for some of us. Uh, the Bible tells us we're justified through the salvation that Christ gave us, but that we've been sanctified as well. Now, that's not a second blessing. It is not a second act of grace. But the word sanctification simply means set apart. And literally for us, it means set apart for holy living. When God saved us, He put us apart to do a job. A young girl wanted to join a church. And she hadn't been a Christian but just a few days. She accepted Christ into her heart. And she came to the church and said she wanted to become a member. And one of the deacons of the church said, well, let me ask you a question. said, uh, were you a sinner before you received Christ into your heart? She said, yes, sir, I was. She said, well, are you still a sinner? She said, yes, sir, I am. He said, well, what has happened in you that's different? She said, well, sir, the best way to say it is this. Before I came to know Christ, I was a sinner running toward sin. But now that Christ has come into my heart, I'm a sinner running from sin. Amen. That's sanctification. A change of heart, a purity of life, and it brings us into a new existence with Him. And God uh, was praying to, or Jesus was praying to His Father, God, I want you to set aside my followers, my disciples. You see, a sanctified Christian is one that's separated from the world. That's hard to do in these days. These are difficult times. And if you had to describe your life, would you describe it as a life separated from the world? Perhaps some could. Maybe others couldn't. These are hard days. But God knows that. And He has set us aside and sanctified us for a purpose. Glenn King has done a lot of work for Disney. He's an animator for Disney. In fact, he drew Ariel for The Little Mermaid. He drew The Beast and Aladdin and other Disney movies. He served as a supervising animator for Pocahontas and so forth. But he came to work for Disney back in 1974. He was very much searching for answers to his life. He felt he had sin that he couldn't get rid of. He had been born into a Catholic family and condemned by his sins, he felt, but he did not know what to do. But he had a friend named Ron Husband who one day was also searching. And on a lunch hour, he noticed that he was reading his Bible, a Bible. Uh, actually, he was reading the New Testament that he had gotten out of a motel room from one of the Gideons. He took that New Testament and was reading it, and Cain asked him, Is there anything in there that can say about how I should go to heaven or how I can get to heaven? Well, his friend was reading John 3.16. And he pointed it out to Cain and handed him that little testament, little Gideon New Testament, he went on to lunch, but on his way back to his office, Cain began to read that verse. Over and over and over, he read John 3.16. And he later said, suddenly, there was something there that wasn't there before. He said, as I began to walk through the streets, I began to say out loud, I believe it. I believe it. Heads were turning to look at this famous man. But he was saying, I believe it. I believe it. And he said later there was a faith I could actually apply and believe in. And from that moment on, I knew I was secure. I didn't need to fear judgment or hell or anything more. Notice that Scripture says that he prays that the Father will keep you through his own name. That is security. And that's what came back. Security. We are saved. We are safe in him. What a wonderful promise that is. But it goes a little further. And if you notice as he keeps reading, he gets a little closer. Chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. He said, my prayer is not for the disciples only, but I pray also for those who will believe in me, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you and I, you're in me and I'm in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Catch those words. If someone says to me, I'm praying for you, that touches me. You ever have anybody say, I'm praying for you? 
Isn't that a warm feeling comes over you? When you know that somebody cares about you enough to pray for you? But how does it strike you when you hear that Jesus is praying for you? What does it mean to you to know that Jesus prayed then and does pray for you? Now, there are many great names in the Bible, many great prayers, but none of them pray for us. Only Jesus Amen. prays for us. What powerful words those are. But that puts a, a different light upon our life. What he asked for, Jesus said, I have given them the glory that you gave me. That's what Jesus says. God has given you, through Jesus, glory. Now, my friend, that's security again. God's not going to take it away. That's already settled. He's not going to say, I'm going to give it to you when you die or when you get to the gate of heaven. He says, I have already, I have given this to them. And believe it or not, you are glorified in the sight of God. And if you are a believer, you are as sure for heaven as is possible for a human being to be. There is no way you're going to miss it because God has put us there and sent us there through His power. And the Romans 8.18 promises that He will show us His glory in and through us. I look at myself and I don't see a lot of glory sometimes, but I do know this, that God has glorified me and you and that we have been saved by His mercy and by His grace, and that we're as sure for heaven as it is possible to be. March 23rd, 1743, when the Messiah, and most of us know that song, parts of it, when it was first performed in London, the clean king was present. And there was a great audience there, and you know this story, basically. It's reported that everybody was so deeply moved by the Hallelujah Chorus, that when the words, for the Lord God omnipotent, omnipotent reigneth, the whole audience, including the king, sprang to their feet for that entire course. And from that time until this, when we hear those words, we rise and we stand in honor of he who comes in the name of the Lord. He is King of kings and Lord of lords, and to him is glory. And this is the God through Jesus Christ, his Son, who has prayed for us. Notice this. It strikes me that when Christ prayed, of all the things He could have asked for, He could have said, help them never to be sick again, help them never to have any financial distress again, help them to always be happy and content in their life, but He didn't say that. He said, Lord, help them to be one. Unity. He prayed that we would be united. He, didn't, he wasn't praying for the Methodist and the Presbyterian and the Baptist all be alike. That's not what he's saying. He's talking about the fact that one in him, we're believers, we're we are children of God. I heard about a guy that, that uh, came to his pastor and said, Pastor, I'm going to go join the Catholic Church. And this Baptist pastor said, Well, Bill, you've been a member of this church for 30 years. You've been a Baptist all your life. Why in the world, after all these years, are you going to go and join the Catholic Church? Bill said, well, I went to the doctor last week, and he told me I wasn't going to live very long, perhaps six months at the most. And he said, I just figured if I'm going to die, it's better to lose one of them than one of us. <laughs> now, that sounds like a good Baptist thing, doesn't it? <laughs> unity. You see, unity is not union. All churches don't act alike. All denominations don't feel alike, but everyone who preaches the truth of the Word of God, Amen. that preaches the salvation through Jesus Christ, are the same. It is a gospel that Jesus says, I want unity preached. And so we as believers in Christ are part of a fellowship that's extremely important. But I come down to verse 24, which is a very important verse, where Jesus says something here that strikes me so much. Notice that he says, Father, I want those whom you have given me to be with me where I am. And to see my glory, the glory that you have given me, because you loved me before the creation of the world. And underscore those words, I want those you have given me, you and me, to be with me wherever I am. He's talking about heaven. That's where he is. 
you're sure for heaven. I don't care what anybody might say, how anybody might deny that. The reality is, believer, you and I are bound for heaven. And that is the promise of God. Jesus has prayed it. His prayers are always answered. And our hope and our security is firm as He prayed. Just think of stepping on shore and finding it heaven. Of taking hold of a hand and finding it God's hand. Of breathing new air and finding it heavenly air. Of feeling invigorating and finding it immortality. Of passing from storm and tempest to an unbroken calm. Of waking up in heaven and finding it home. And the reality is for every believer that is going to be the case in God's timing. His prayer for us guarantees it. Let's bow our heads together. Now, the Lord knows all of our hearts today. He knows who I am, who you are. You know, and, and all of us are in various levels of sanctification. You know, none of us are what we'd like to be, perhaps. None of us may be as great sometimes as we think we are. But the Lord knows everything about us. And maybe there's someone here today who would say, in all of my life, I've never come to know the Lord. I've never given my heart to Christ. And my friend, we are here. That's what church is about, ultimately. It's to bring people to know the Savior. We want you to be glorified like other believers, to be in heaven with us. And the way you do that is by inviting Christ Jesus into your heart to forgive your sins and to be your Savior. And you can do that right here. Right here. And we'll be here at the front to help you any way we can in just a moment. There may be those who'd like to unite with this church. God leading you that direction. What a wonderful place. What wonderful people. You're surrounded by people who love the Lord and love you. If God is speaking to your heart, we invite you to come. There may be others who just need to come and kneel here to share in a word of prayer, to do whatever it is God may be leading you to do. Whatever God wants of you as we stand together and Brother Jim leads us, will you come and obedient to Him, whatever He asks. Will you come as we say?